June 26, 1944. Imagine a civilian, a man whose fame was eclipsed only by his controversy, walking into a military airbase in the middle of a brutal war. The pilots, hardened combat veterans, were skeptical. The visitor was 42, a former colonel whose anti-war politics had made him an enemy of the president. He was there to talk about the P-38 Lightning, the sleek, twin-boomed fighter that was already America's longest-range aircraft in the Pacific. What neither the skeptical airman nor the aviator himself knew was that this chance meeting on June 26, 1944, at Hillandia Air Base in Dutch New Guinea, would not only save lives, but also completely revolutionize long-range fighter operations. This civilian, Charles Lindbergh, would share a simple, counterintuitive technique that would transform the impossible, flying nine-hour combat missions, into standard operating procedure extending the P-38's combat radius by nearly 400 miles. He was about to teach America's top fighter pilots that everything they knew about engine management was incomplete. Lindbergh's expertise wasn't theoretical. It was forged 17 years earlier, between May 20th and 21st, 1927, when he flew 3,600 miles nonstop from New York to Paris. During that solo flight in the spirit of St. Louis, carrying 450 gallons of fuel, he navigated using a periscope and dead reckoning, managing his fuel consumption with a meticulous precision that seemed paranoid to other pilots of his era. He landed with 85 gallons to spare, achieving an economy experts considered impossible. That fanatical focus on fuel management became his signature technical skill. Throughout the 1930s, working for Pan American Airways, Lindbergh conducted survey flights across both the Pacific and Atlantic, constantly refining techniques that pushed aircraft range far beyond the manufacturer's published limits. He understood that every engine had a sweet spot, an optimal operating envelope where power, fuel consumption, and stress reached a perfect, efficient balance. Finding it required a specialized understanding of manifold pressure, propeller RPM, mixture settings, and indicated airspeed that military training simply didn't cover. By 1944, Lindbergh was a world-class expert, but his relationship with the U.S. military was a wreck. His pre-war isolationism and leadership of the America First Committee had earned him the personal animosity of President Franklin Roosevelt. After Roosevelt publicly compared him to a Civil War Confederate sympathizer, Lindbergh resigned his Air Reserve Colonel's commission. When Pearl Harbor happened, Roosevelt personally ensured Lindbergh would never wear an American military uniform again during the war. But expertise, like water, always finds a way. Unable to serve as an officer, Lindbergh became a civilian technical consultant for aircraft manufacturers. In 1943, he joined United Aircraft Corporation, working on the F-4U Corsair and troubleshooting B-24 Liberator production problems at Ford's Willow Run plant. He even flew dangerous high-altitude test flights in P-47 Thunderbolts. By early 1944, Lindbergh saw his opening. United Aircraft needed a technical representative to observe P-38 operations in the Pacific. He convinced them to send him. His deployment was authorized by the Navy Department and kept secret from the White House. Neither Roosevelt nor the Secretary of the Navy knew he was headed to the war zone. His assignment began as observation, but soon Marine Corps aviation officers invited him to fly as an observer on combat missions. On May 21, 1944, he flew his first combat sortie, a strafing run near the Japanese garrison at Rabaul. He quickly demonstrated a practical expertise that surpassed theory, teaching Corsair pilots how to safely take off with bomb loads double the F-4U's rated capacity, which reduced accidents while boosting strike capability. By mid-June, he focused on the P-38 Lightning specifically the 475th Fighter Group, Satan's Angels, 
one of the Pacific's premier P-38 units, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Charles MacDonald. On June 20th, Lindbergh got checked out in a P-38, his first time in the distinctive twin-boomed fighter. Six days later, he walked into MacDonald's recreation hall at Hillandia. Initially dismissed, he gained MacDonald's attention when he mentioned that General Hutchinson, the 3rd Air Task Force commander, had sent him. MacDonald, a 10-victory ace, invited him to fly a mission the next day. On the morning of June 27, Lindbergh flew his first P-38 combat mission, flying on the wing of Major Thomas McGuire, a 15-victory ace. Lindbergh's formation flying was flawless, impressive for a pilot checked out only days earlier. The mission was a successful strafing run on an enemy barge, but the crew chiefs noticed something truly significant after the flight. Mission after mission, Lindbergh's P-38 consistently returned with substantially more fuel remaining than any other aircraft. After a six-and-a-half-hour armed reconnaissance mission to Gilvink Bay, he landed with 210 gallons of fuel left, while others returned with tanks near empty. MacDonald, seeing the undeniable evidence, called a meeting. Two days after Lindbergh's arrival, under the glaring, unshaded light bulbs of the crude recreation hall, Lindbergh explained his cruise control techniques to the assembled pilots. Standard P-38 procedure called for cruising at 2200 to 2400 RPM with an auto-rich mixture setting, which was safe but wasteful. Lindbergh recommended dramatically lowering the engine speed to 1600 RPM, changing the fuel mixture to auto-lean and slightly increasing manifold pressure to 30 inches of mercury to maintain an indicated airspeed of 185 miles per hour. This specific combination reduced fuel consumption to 70 gallons per hour, achieving 2.6 miles per gallon. He predicted this would stretch the Lightning's radius by 400 miles, enabling nine-hour missions. The pilots were stunned. Nine hours in a cramped cockpit, sitting on a parachute and an emergency raft, seemed inconceivable. More troubling, Lindbergh's recommendation of low RPM and high manifold pressure was called running over square, a practice military flight training specifically warned against, claiming it would cause detonation, overheating, and catastrophic engine failure. The skepticism was palpable, but MacDonald knew Lindbergh had flown combat missions using these settings without engine trouble. The colonel decided to put the technique to an operational test. Over the next week, pilots cautiously experimented. Engines sounded different, a deep rumble replacing the normal roar, but the critical indicators, cylinder head temperatures, actually ran cooler than at higher RPMs. The fuel savings were undeniable. The P-38's effective combat radius, previously about 570 miles, quickly extended to 700, then 750 miles. Pilots could now reach distant targets, fight for a quarter of an hour over the area, and still return with a one-hour fuel reserve. The transformation was revolutionary, and the skepticism vanished. Lindbergh flew regularly with the 475th, accumulating combat hours and teaching by example, sometimes leading flights under the simple call sign, Mr. Lindbergh. He explained the physics, Reducing RPM meant fewer combustion cycles, and by increasing manifold pressure, the same power was produced more efficiently, burning less fuel per unit of time. The lean mixture further enhanced this by providing only the necessary fuel for complete combustion, unlike the wasteful auto-rich setting. The technique was not dangerous because, despite being over-square by ratio, the 30 inches of manifold pressure was moderate, well below the 60-inch settings used for combat. Lindbergh's knowledge, perfected over years of long-range flight, coupled with the P-38's twin-engine redundancy, which provided a safety margin for experimentation, made the risk acceptable. Crucially, the supply situation was favorable. Allison was shipping spare engines, meaning the operational advantage of extended range justified any small risk of increased engine wear. No P-38 engines failed due to Lindbergh's cruise techniques. By late July, his techniques were spreading. His most dramatic moment came on July 28, 1944, during a bomber escort mission. His flight encountered two Japanese K-51 Sonas. 
One was quickly shot down, but the other, piloted by Captain Saburo Shimada, an experienced pilot, fought on for 30 minutes. Shimada, unable to shake the P-38s, unexpectedly turned directly toward the approaching Lindbergh. In a terrifying head-on pass at a closing speed of nearly 500 miles per hour, Lindbergh instinctively pressed his trigger, his cannon and machine guns erupting for six seconds. Bullets and shells slammed into the Sona's engine, slowing the propeller and forcing the plane into a fatal dive. Lindbergh pulled up violently, his P-38 passing mere feet over the damaged Japanese aircraft. Unofficially, the pilots agreed. Lindbergh had scored his first and only kill. The victory was not officially recorded, as his civilian status made combat participation irregular, and logging a kill might have ended his time with the unit. Three days later, during a fighter sweep to the Palau Islands, Lindbergh nearly died in a turning fight with a Japanese Zero. Only McDonald's intervention saved his life. The close call convinced 5th Air Force headquarters that he had proven his point. He had flown about 50 combat missions, shot down an enemy aircraft, and was nearly killed. It was time for him to return home. On August 12, 1944, Lindbergh left Hollandia. The pilots of the 475th, including America's future second-highest-scoring ace, Major Thomas McGuire, saw him off, their respect genuine. By October 1944, P-38 units across the Pacific were using variations of his cruise control settings. The operational implications were profound. Targets that were once unreachable became accessible. Japanese bases that had enjoyed immunity from fighter escorts now faced P-38s with enough fuel to fight and return safely. The extended range allowed fighters to escort bombers on missions that had previously been flown unescorted or not flown at all. The P-38 groups in Dutch New Guinea were soon flying 950 miles to targets, fighting for 15 minutes and returning to base, missions that had been impossible before. The extended combat radius directly supported General MacArthur's advance toward the Philippines. The technique also saved lives, giving pilots reserves for weather detours or battle damage. Though some commanders and pilots initially resisted, the evidence was overwhelming. Units using Lindbergh's techniques reported no increase in engine failures, fuel consumption data showed dramatic improvements, and mission reports documented successful operations that were previously impossible. By late 1944, Lindbergh's cruise control technique was officially incorporated into P-38 operating procedures, and the U.S. Army Air Forces published updated cruise control charts. Lindbergh's story is one of technical redemption. In the Pacific, Far from Washington politics, Marine and Army Air Force pilots judged him not on his isolationism, but on his courage and skill. Major Richard Bong, America's highest-scoring ace, said Lindbergh was as hot a pilot as any of us. The civilian technical consultant with specialized knowledge of fuel efficiency had transformed an aircraft's capabilities. He arrived as a celebrity and departed as a comrade having taught the finest fighter pilots in the Pacific that published limits were merely starting points, and that understanding an aircraft completely could unlock capabilities hidden in plain sight. That knowledge, proven in combat and adopted throughout the theater, represents one of the most successful technical innovations of the Pacific Air War.